Coming up on this week's show, Lisa is here with Specfic and Romantic Suspense recommendations. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome to episode 202 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Will from willcanals.com, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Mr. Jeff Adams. Hi, everybody. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. We'll have more information on how you can join them at the end of the show, along with a sneak peek of what we have coming up for you next week. Well, it's been a week for us. Indeed. Um, I don't know about you all. I'm sure most of you are probably (laughs) getting ready for back to school, if that hasn't happened already. Uh, We spent some time in the sultry south. Mm -hmm. Uh, As we mentioned previously, we headed down to uh, Florida, Orlando specifically, and we took part in podcast movement. Yes, we did. And sultry might be an understatement. Let's just call Orlando gross last week. (laughs) It was was a little gnarly, I gotta say. From the moment we stepped out of the airport, it's like, woof. (laughs) Wow. Uh, You folks who live in Orlando are a hearty stock. Living (laughs) through that humidity down there. Goodness. Mm -hmm. Some really impressive thunderstorms, though. I won't go too off on the weather, but there were some that rumbled through the hotel, and it was pretty darned impressive. But yes, we were at Podcast Movement last week, and that was an amazing event. It was the biggest event we've ever been to. There was the word that there were somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 registered attendees. And if you think about something like a GRL, when you add the readers and the authors together, that's about 500, wouldn't you say? Usually, yes. Yeah. Uh, Something like an RT or an RWA hovers at around the 2,000 mark. And so this was podcast movement was big, and we learned so much stuff. Uh, You'll see over the coming weeks uh, possibly some upgrades and tweaks in this show as we bring in some of our learnings and interesting learnings that we talked about over on our new show, the Big Gate Author Podcast, because we learned a lot of stuff and we're kind of took in some stuff that's also good for authors. So if you haven't checked out our new show at Big Gay Author Podcast, please go check that out, biggayauthorpodcast.com. Uh, and I had, I have to say, I had some tech geek out moments. There was so much equipment there, all of these different microphones and mixing boards and things that I could push buttons and light up. It, was, it, it made my techie heart so happy. Um, <laughs> what would you say to kind of succinctly put podcast movement for our dear listeners out there? Well... In addition to the learnings and stuff, um, it was a really wonderful, unique event. I think I mentioned on the author podcast, it was so wonderful to be surrounded by so many people who are so passionate about passionate about the same thing you are. Mm-hmm. And there were uh, newbies and professionals and... And people who've been doing this for like a decade or more. And we were all there to talk about and learn about the same thing. And it was just, um, it was a lot of fun. I I wasn't nearly as overwhelmed as I thought I might be because it's, you know, frankly, such a humongous event. Um, it was just really nice. It was interesting. I was worried about being overwhelmed by the people too, because I think we mentioned in the RWA episode a couple of weeks back that that was a couple thousand people spread out on six floors. So you never really could take in the enormity of the event. Here, we were all stuffed down into a section of the convention center in this hotel. And yet, I never felt like there were too many people about. No. Nope. Which was kind of cool. No, made my introvert heart happy. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Some other news worth mentioning this week, there was information came out about the new Love, Simon series that the Disney Plus streaming service is going to be launching. Uh, It has a lead actor now with Michael Camino, and Anna Ortiz is going to be playing his mom. We, of course, love Anna from Ugly Betty and more recently Whiskey Cavalier. 
Uh, it's awesome that we're going to see persons of color take on roles in this new series. And apparently Michael's character is going to be new at Creekside High and is going to need to reach out to Simon to help navigate being out at school. Nick Robinson, who played Simon in the movie, is going to be along as a recurring character in the series, but will also be the series narrator. And he is also on board as a series producer. So Disney Plus, come take my money. <laughs> um, because I will certainly be subscribing to see the Love, Simon series. Disney Plus launches as a service on November 12th. Uh, the reports this week said that the Simon series is currently shooting, but I did not see a premiere date, but that is still super exciting. Indeed. And there was also exciting news in the MM romance genre this week. Uh, it broke on Facebook from Sloan Kennedy that her and Lucy Lennox were out at Sony Pictures Entertainment taking a Hollywood meeting. They've got a producer who's apparently interested in their Twist of Fate series, as well as some of their solo books. And this is just super exciting overall. It's great for Lucy and Sloan. It is tremendous for our genre that we're getting picked up in this way. Uh, you can look back a little further earlier this year to when uh, Casey McQuiston's uh, Red, White, and Royal Blue was op optioned by Amazon. So tremendous things for the storytellers in our genre. And we certainly congratulate Lucy and Sloan on the opportunity and hope it comes to some awesome fruition. Hi, I'm Jay from the LGBTQ romance review blog, Joyfully Jay. At Joyfully Jay, we review tons of LGBTQ romance, as well as romantic fiction and nonfiction. We review eBooks, audiobooks, and even the occasional movie. We typically review about 18 books a week, so Joyfully J is a great place to hear about new releases, catch up on books you may have missed, and find some new favorites. In addition to our reviews, each weekday we host an author as our first post of the day. This gives readers a chance to learn more about new releases, get exclusive excerpts, find out about the author, and participate in great giveaways. Each author post on Joyfully J is exclusive, so you get access to book and author information you can't find other places. At Joyfully J, we love LGBTQ romance and are excited to share it with you. Stop by the blog at joyfullyj.com. You can also visit us on our Facebook group, The Joyful Jays. We'd love to have you join us. So before we get into the books for this week, some quick summer TV mentions. Uh, we are two weeks in to the... BH90210 series, which is a reboot of 90210. Well, sort of a reboot. I didn't quite know what to expect here, but I have, I love this shot of nostalgia and how they've structured this. You've got the entire original principal cast of 90210 back, and they're all playing slightly fictional versions of themselves. Uh, and they get back together at a 30th anniversary con for the series end up getting arrested for trying to steal a prop dress. It's so incredibly goofy and yet heartfelt and pushes all my nostalgia buttons. And it's so much fun. There's even a little nefariousness going on with like a super fan who looks like he belongs in a Lifetime movie. He may have been in a Lifetime movie because he looks a little bit familiar <laughs> to some degree. Uh, there's even a little bit of LGBTQ content coming in here as... Uh, Gabrielle Cateras, who played Andrea in the original show, she's exploring a little bit of bisexuality, perhaps, and she wants to bring that into Andrea's character as they do the reboot. So that's been interesting. But it's been really, really nice seeing all these actors come back together. There were some nice moments in the first episode where they paid tribute to Luke Perry, who had died just before uh, they started shooting this this series. So. It just pushes all my happy nostalgia buttons, having been somebody who watched all 10 years of the original 90210. <laughs> so, yeah, have you been enjoying it as well? I have. I love this an awful, awful lot. And not necessarily just because of the nostalgia factor. I think everyone involved is um, fully aware. They're very self-aware. Mm -hmm. And they t they're all totally 100% in on the joke. And um, they're kind of uh, poking fun at themselves and what, you know, Hollywood and fandom and, you know, being a public figure is all about. And uh, I'm just I'm really enjoying it so far. 
Uh, it's probably got a couple more episodes left in its summer series run. Um, we highly recommend you check out the new 90210. Uh, in addition to that summer series, we are also still enjoying Grand Hotel. We mentioned this a couple of episodes back, uh, and it's really going strong. Um, it is beautiful, bonkers, soapy goodness. I really, really love this show, and I don't think it's quite getting the viewership that it deserves. Um, you're, you probably pay more attention than the, to the Hollywood stuff than I do. Um, yeah, not it's... many people are, you know, tuning in. Uh, we recommend you check out Grand Hotel. It's about a family-owned hotel in, uh, is it Miami Beach or South Beach? I think it's Miami Beach. Okay. And um, all the craziness that goes on behind the scenes of uh, running this family business and uh, sexiness and craziness and shenanigans, uh, of course, ensue. It's also worth noting that in this particular series, one of the main characters is exploring her bisexuality. Or, well, maybe she's a lesbian. She's not 100% sure just <laughs> yet. Uh, she's kind of trying to figure that out. Um, so we highly recommend both 90210 and Grand Hotel. Yes. So you have a book for us this week. You've dived back into the world of Sylvia Violet. Yes, uh, this past week I listened to Anticipating Rejection by Sylvia Violet, as Jeff Jeff mentioned, and it is book two in her Anticipation series. Um, anticipate Anticipation, blah, blah, blah. see if I can say that five more times fast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, essentially a small mountain town in Wyoming, and we first got a glimpse of this small town setting in Anticipating Disaster. Um, in that book, they kind of gave us a sneak peek of what was to come, and uh, this time the entirety of the book takes place in this Wyoming town, and it concerns Dell and Noah. Now, five years ago, um, when uh, both Dell and Noah were uh, 18, uh, they just graduated from high school, um, they had finally consummated their relationship. They'd been best friends, and that summer after they'd graduated, they'd finally admitted their feelings for one another, and they'd hooked up, and it was amazing, but Dell ran scared. Mm -hmm. He essentially came out to his parents, but was so afraid of, um, well, it, <laughs> that was a big step for him personally. He was sort of the town golden boy. He comes from a you know rich, wealthy ranching family, and you know there was a lot of pressure on him. Uh, so instead of dealing with that, he decided to head on out of Dodge. There you go. Uh, I'm out of here. And so five years later, uh, Dell has returned with his three-year-old daughter in tow which is kind of a surprise to everybody, including Noah. Noah is the guy who stayed behind. Uh, he works at his mother's bakery, and he's pretty content living in anticipation uh, until Dell returns and kind of flips his world upside down as all those emotions that they'd had before kind of like, you know, return instantaneously. Mm -hmm. um, nothing has changed in that respect. Um, from the moment they see each other again, um, the the chemistry, the heat, all those emotions, they come right back. And this is sort of, um, as you can tell from my description so far, this is uh, <laughs> essentially a second chance romance. And I'm not sure if I have much more to say um, because so much of the conflict was um, internal. Uh, it was emotional stuff that they had to deal with. Um, essentially... Uh, Re-establishing their relationship, mm -hmm. uh, especially where um, uh, Dell's young daughter Cl Cl Clarice, I'm sorry, I had trouble saying that, um, uh, where his young daughter is concerned and kind of figuring out the dynamics of all of that. Um, there was uh, one moment where they went out on essentially their first date to the local pizza joint and uh, encountered some homophobes and kind of had to deal with that situation. But everything else is pretty much um, internal and about their feelings and all the stuff that they have to talk through. Um, and when I describe it that way, I know it sounds like incredibly boring, but what <laughs> Sylvia Violet uh, actually manages to do is really bring to life 
um, sort of the the history and the emotions of these two characters and you really end up rooting for them and you want to make sure that they have like a a solid emotional ground so they can move forward because I think I th I've mentioned this in reviews in the past is that sometimes when you encounter two characters in a romance novel you just know instantaneously that these people are supposed to be mm -hmm. together and I think that's the case with Dell and Noah and the book is actually really about them uh, figuring that out and kind of navigating uh, what their relationship is going to look like in the future. Uh, it is a romance novel, so of course they do end up working it all out. Um, I really enjoyed this entry in the Anticipation series. Um, the third book uh, came out a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to dive into that as soon as I possibly can. <laughs> You do love some Sylvia Violet. I do. It's really, it's, really good it's, stuff. It's a good thing. Also, because this is a Sylvia book, the sex is very intense and a teensy bit kinky. Um, it's a little... Um, it's a little... What's the word I'm trying to use? Unexpectedly, Dell likes to be uh, bossed around in bed. Um, he is like the, the big, strong... Uh, daddy type, but um, <laughs> it's Noah who takes charge in the bedroom, uh, and so there are some sizzling scenes in that respect. Very cool. Awesome that you had a, a good book to read on our travels this week. Yeah. Uh, I, too, had a whole book to read. Uh, it's the beautiful thing about being on an airplane. you <laughs> got nothing better to do. You, you get to read a good book, and in this case, I got to read it all the way through as we crossed the country. Uh, I read King Slayer by Layla Rain, which is the second book in the Fog City series. Now, it's well documented in this podcast that I love Layla's brand of romantic suspense. And it was just back in episode 193 that I raved about Prince of Killers, which is the first Fog City book. Oh my gosh, King Slayer, I'm about <laughs> to rave some more, so just hang on to your hats here, folks. Uh, Fog City is very much an episodic series that does need to be re read in order. So if you haven't read Prince of Killers yet, let me just say you need to go do that like right now. And you also might want to skip forward about five minutes so that I don't spoil your read. These books are so connected because of the cliffhanger that ended book one that it's impossible for me to talk about book two without starting to get into spoiler material. And oh, by the way, cliffhanger folks, there's a good cliffhanger at the end of King Slayer too. So if cliffhangers aren't your thing, you may want to wait for that third book to come out later this fall and just do the entire trilogy. In fact, if this was a TV show, Prince of Killers would have been a perfect mid-season finale because you would definitely show up for King Slayer because of the reveal at the end of Prince. It turned out that Dante was actually ATF agent Christopher Perry, and he shares this information to mob boss Hawes Madigan, who he's got handcuffed naked to a bed. Now, Hawes... As one does. As one does, yeah. <laughs> it happens. Hawes is, of course, furious that he trusted Dante, or now as he knows him, Chris. He let Chris into his family, and now he's got another threat to deal with on top of the issues that were already presented in the first book. Now, it turns out Chris was embedded with the Madigans because the ATF wants to end the family's reign, and especially the use of explosives. He's also there for personal reasons because three years before, his partner Isabella was killed while she was working on the case against the Madigans. Chris wants justice for her killer, but that ends up to be one twisty road. In fact, the entire story is a delicious, twisted adventure. I mentioned with Prince of Killers that it was the first romantic suspense I'd read where the main character was on the wrong side of the law. Now, Chris may be ATF, but he's not exactly clean in his dealings either. Falling hard for Hawes isn't the only misstep he's made recently. And complicating everything is the threat to the Madigans from people who don't like that Hawes is trying to change how the family operates with rules like no indiscriminate killing and no collateral damage. Where this plot goes in the book with the threat against the family just was a continual mind blow. Layla does an amazing job at throwing obstacles at Chris, Hawes, and the entire family. Just when it seems that they've got a grip on things, something or someone else comes into the picture. The shades of gray that everyone operates in only adds to the story. 
the the right and wrong gets so very fuzzy, and that really adds some terrific nuances to the story. It's it's interesting how you know you always look for depth of character, mm-hmm. and here there's so many other nuances to the story that even go beyond the characters themselves. It's really awesome. Now, beyond solving the mystery of who's after the Madigans, Chris and Hawes have to find their way back to trust. Even the revelations at the top of the story don't quell the fire the men have for each other. It's a slow, bumpy road back to trust at any level for them, even though it's something that they both want. It's another area that Layla excels in, where she often moves them one step forward and then two or maybe even ten steps backwards. Chris gets a revelation in this book, too, that shines a lot of light on his character. Like we discovered about Hawes in book one, Chris has some heavy baggage in his past, and you just want to see him comforted as he speaks his truth. Problem is, there's really not time for that in all of this. The story moved at a breakneck pace, and it was so good that I was on a plane because I got to do this with just minimal interruption. Had I had to put this book down for any length of time, I would have been freaked out because I wanted to come (laughs) back to the story. As I mentioned at the start, there's another cliffhanger, and luckily Fog City 3 will be out sometime this fall, so we can see how this trilogy wraps up for Chris, Hawes, and the Madigans. Now, a couple of extra character shout-outs here. Police Chief Kane, who we first met over in the Whiskeyverse, is one complicated guy. I really haven't liked him much until this particular book. He's just as complex as everyone else, and I really enjoyed how he evolved for me in Kingslayer. And speaking of the whiskey verse, there's some great mention of uh, some favorite characters sprinkled inside this book. Then there's Jax, an SFPD IT guy who's introduced here. Uh, they were so excellent. I mean, he was a great IT resource, very much in the, in the vein of Jamie and Lauren from Whiskey Verse. An amazing personality and clearly more there than could be fully fleshed out in this book. I hope their story gets some serious on-screen time as the uh, series continues. So yes, I completely recommend ever so, yeah, just go get the books, people. Uh, Kingslayer from Layla Rain. It's tight suspense, great romantic tension, and as soon as book three is available, I will be all over that. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the books or anything else that we've talked about in this week's show, all you have to do is go to the show notes page for episode 202, and that's at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. Want to hang out with us between shows? Check us out on Facebook. You never know what we might post. News about book sales, bonus video content, and maybe even a live broadcast or two. Like us today at Facebook.com slash Big Gay Fiction Podcast and see what we get up to next. And just a reminder that we are live on Facebook on Sunday mornings. Uh, We go live with the recording of the show around 1030 Eastern Time. That's 730 Pacific. You can hang out with the folks who watch us do all of our shenanigans live. Uh, And it would be great to see you there one Sunday morning. Now, we get to welcome Lisa from the Novel Approach back to the show. She's got some great speculative fiction and some romantic suspense to tell us about. So, shall we get to that? Yeah. Welcome back, Lisa. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's always good to be here. So, I know you've got some good stuff lined up for us. Tell, Tell us what you've been reading this summer. Oh, I do. I've had an amazing month of reading. Um, Actually, 2019 has been a pretty great year of reading so far. We've got some really great books that have come out this year, but just very recently I've read a couple of speculative fiction books, uh, uh, romantic suspense, murder mystery. Um, So I will start out my first read. I'll go by release. Okay. July 29th, Allie Theron, or Therene, and I apologize to Allie for not knowing the pronunciation of her last name, uh, dropped a book from Karina Press called Spellbound. And it's one of those, one of those books where I just, I read it in a day. I got to 91% and my husband asked me to go for a walk and I looked at him like, are you kidding me? Do you see what I'm doing? Come back in 10%. (laughs) While I'm reading? But I literally devoured it in a day. Uh, It is uh, is a a book set in 1925, Prohibition era, post-World War I, New York City. And Allie just really gets the 
spirit of what I would imagine maybe New York City was like back then. Um, the the speakeasies and the rum runners and and even the language, you know, is just a, a, a very seems very authentic to the time. So uh, in there is the protagonists are uh, Rory Brodigan, who is a scryer. So this is this is a, a magical realm uh, in New York City. He works. He's a scryer and he works at um, an antiques shop in Hell's Kitchen which is so great, right? Yeah. So he works in the antiques shop in Hell's Kitchen and he works very much in the background. He is, um, he, he keeps very much to himself and, and rightfully so because the, the uh, magical folks, uh, the people who have these paranormal abilities are, are uh, not necessarily welcome. Um, there is, a, there is a, a thread of kind of a, a prejudice and xenophobia throughout the, the uh, book as well. And so he works in the, in the back room of the antique shop and he is responsible for making sure that the antiques are authentic. And so, uh, so the, his, who ends up being his eventual love interest, uh, Arthur Kenzie, who goes by ACE, um, brings in a, a box full of letters and basically, basically tricks Mrs. Brodigan, who is the owner of the antique store into, uh, revealing that, that she does actually have an authentic scryer. Uh, it was it was it was unknown, at, uh, at, but Ace wanted to make sure that he was getting an authentic uh, uh, scryer. So so he, the relationship between he and Rory starts off on the wrong foot to begin mm. with because of the trickery. Um, but uh, Ace is is in possession of uh, of a, a relic. Um, that he needs to understand what it does. And it, it holds a very dangerous power and, uh, and it, to the point where it could really destroy New York City or, or a, a lot of, uh, to take a lot of lives if, if it falls into the wrong hands. So uh, throughout the story, you know, you've got Rory, who's just this hard scrabble, prickly guy, you know, just is a bit of a loner, um, poor, you know, just living hand to mouth day to day. And then you have Ace, who is a wealthy socialite, well-educated. Um, and so it's very much an opposites, a trash kind of story as well. But it, Ace is not the the typical disaffected socialite. Um, he's he's got a heart of gold, and he's just an amazing, just a caring person. And so the the way he and Rory relate to each other is is very interesting uh, in in the opposites spectrum, and how Rory eventually comes around to trust Ace. So it's just it's got a lot of magic and adventure and uh, just imagination and authentic feel to it. And, and Allie just does a really amazing job of translating uh, the story and just drawing you in not only by the heart, but by the imagination. So, so Spellbound, I thought was just an absolutely phenomenal read. It was a single, one of those uh, single sitting, unput downable kind of books. I just loved it. Oh, those are the best. <laughs> yeah. Aren't they just, I mean, just, you know, Kindle out. <laughs> Don't bother me kind of reads. It was great. It was great. So Spellbound, uh, Karina Press, Allie, Allie Thera North, Therene again, I apologize for not knowing the exact pronunciation, but it's just absolutely, absolutely great. Very diverse um, cast. And, and I just I, I just loved the authenticity, the authenticity of it. And New York City is always such a great place yeah. to set any kind of urban fantasy um, because it's it's such a character unto itself, you know. Mm -hmm. so. And we all know it so well. I mean, yeah. even from the yeah. 1920s, we've seen the movies of that era. We understand kind of what that was. And, well, and and the history of New York City yeah. itself is is so broad and diverse and fascinating. And even if you've never been to New York City, you know you 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 can you still know enough about it to understand you know uh, exactly why it's such a special place to set an urban fantasy book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
for sure. Yeah, so so and, spellbound, fabulous. And, and you've got more spec fic for us too. I do. Uh, when I was on earlier this year, uh, one of my best reads of 2018, my my top picks of 2018 was a book called Prince of Air and Darkness by M.A. Grant. And she just recently released the sequel to that on August 5th, again from Karina Press. Karina just kind of hit a couple of home runs for me this this month. Um, it's called the, the Marked Prince. And it is a continuation. This is not a standalone. It is it is a continuation of of what was built in the first book, which uh, a lot of a lot of the drama and action in the first book um, uh, was a was a precursor to this looming war that's that's happening. And this book is 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 a fairy tale, but not in the Disney fairy tale sense. It is actually the Irish Fae. So so you're in the the unseely court and the seely court. So you've got the the dark winter court and the and the light summer court. And um, this book carries on with with Rourke's brother, who was mentioned in the first book as a defector. He he high prince slain defected uh, from from the unseely court to the seely court. And so this book picks up with with his story and and uh, his. Um, negotiation to, uh, with with the unseelie king and queen um, to try to broker some sort of peace, and it goes horribly, horribly wrong. So, so Se Sebastian, who was a character as Finn's best friend, who was a character in the first book as well, um, he is he is a hybrid. He is half unseelie and half seelie. So, so you get that instant. Um, the instant conflict for him in being of both worlds and belonging to neither. And so, so he has been, um, he has been drafted basically to, to go to uh, use his connections to the Seely court to try to rescue the high prince slain from I guess I shouldn't say rescue since he defected, but but to try to bring him back so that it, you don't know if if it's just to bring him back, to bring him back into the family fold, or if you, if they want to bring him back to see him face justice for his defection. So so it's it, uh, Sebastian goes into this a very unlikely hero, and you know his story just immediately kind of pulls you in by the heart, and he uh, he sees a, a slave to the high princess Aoife of, of the Seelie court, who is, is being tortured brutally in front of, in front of an audience of people. And so Sebastian steps in and, and requests of the king to grant him um, an assistant, being Dween, wants, wants Dween to be his, his personal assistant while he's, while he's there in the Seelie court. And, and the king, Oberon, it's Oberon and Titania. So she does all of these fun, you know, the fun things that you you go through and you find from Shakespeare and from Irish uh, folklore. Um, so so the the entirety of the book then is is Sebastian, this very kind hearted man um, befriending Duane and just showing him that, you know, there is um there is kindness and there is gentleness in the world and 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 uh, there is a, a secret identity component to the story as well um, that unfolds as it as it goes along and it just and again it's just another one of those books that is just so um, it, it's just so awesome in the way that ma um, builds the world. And it's one of those, one of those books. And, you know, I, I think that again, reading is such a personal thing for everybody, but when an author can write a sentence and just make you stop reading for a moment to absorb it, her, her absorb it, her, she almost has a poetic kind of prose. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's just so, so deeply atmospheric. And, um, the, the way, the way she writes is, is just so, so vivid and it, it is absolutely, um, fitting style of writing to the 
stories that she writes. Uh, it, it just, it, it's a, it's just another, again, Karina Press just, she, MA just hit this one out of the park again, and it's a trilogy. So there's one more book yet to come. Um, so I'm very, very excited about that. But uh, The Marked Prince, it, it is, it, it is action, it's suspense, it's romance, it's, it's creative, it's just kind of the whole ball of wax. It's just really, really a great, great book. So loved that one, loved that one a bunch. And I'm looking forward to the Iron Crown, which I'm not sure when that one comes out, but I know it's in the process of being written now. So, so that will be kind of the culmination of, you know, is there going to be a war? Is there not going to be a war? You know, yeah. So that was a good one. It sounded Excellent. like it ticked a lot of boxes too, hitting so many of those like subgenre boxes of mystery and suspense and romance and all of that. Yes, and and yeah, and then you know, and the, and the 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 folklore and 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 the drawing of inspiration from from different, you know, uh, again from Midsummer Night's Dream and 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 there is a very very prominent character from a Midsummer Night's Dream in the story who plays a huge massive role uh in in this book in particular and uh it's it's just it's just really really a phenomenal series if if you enjoy mythology legend speculative fiction just lots of lots of stuff to sink your brain into <laughs> yeah very cool so we've come to the part of the show where we have to raise our fan flag for gregory <laughs> ash <laughs> It's getting to be a, a kind of kind of a, a broken record sort of thing, isn't it? Second verse, same as the first. <laughs> a little bit. I mean, because I, I mentioned I, I reviewed uh, books four and five and Hazard and Somerset just a couple of weeks ago back in episode 199 and mentioned that they would be hearing more about Gregory Ash soon because I was moving on to book six in that yeah. series. But you've read now the recently released book two from Borealis Investigations. Yes. Tell us everything and and well, without well, of course giving away everything, everything. <laughs> well, <laughs> tell us well, what we need to know <laughs> yeah well transposition uh book two in the borealis investigation series is pretty much um it, it's it's the hallmark of of what gregory ash does so well it's pinnacle peak gregory ash romantic expense uh, uh suspense murder mystery uh it's it's it is a book that's so indicative of the way that he creates these characters who are imperfect, who are sometimes deeply, deeply flawed. And, and he, he gives them love interests that are often, you know, just slow burn, years of yearning, years of denial. And, and that's, that's very much the case for North and Shaw. And, and he believably makes them fall in love, but it's not a love fixes everything situation ever because, mm. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know that this is not going to be some happy fantasy where they fall in love and, and everything becomes magically, ah, you know, <laughs> you know, that it's, it's, um, you know, it's not all violins and hearts. So, you know, that, that, um, when North and Shaw ultimately do confront the years of misunderstandings between them and the years of avoidance and the years of self doubts and self recriminations, which is another thing he does so well. He just, he makes his characters so humanly flawed. Um, you know, it's, it's not just about their past, but it's, it's about how much of their past have shaped them and how much of their past still influence them. And so it, the 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 situation between uh, Shaw and North is very much the elephant in the room throughout the entirety of the book. Um, but then alongside of all of that, all of these great characterizations and these great interactions and the way he uses dialogue to to delineate his relationships and his characters and to tell the story is also these great mysteries where it's never, Let's get from point A to point B. You get from point A 
and then you might go over here because there's an F, and then <laughs> you come back here because there's an H that also influences everything else. So it's kind of an A to Z that goes like this, you know? Yeah. So his, he just, he weaves and tangles all of these, uh, these different variables and factors into his book so beautifully. So, so you, it's very difficult for you to go, oh, I know how this is going to turn out because you just very rarely ever know how it's going to turn out. And, and so this is very much the case in this particular book, there is still the long arc of the, of the, of the series, the mystery of, of the West end slasher. But then in this particular um, book, he confronts the murder of, of uh, a chef Collins who was a, uh, uh, an advocate of gay conversion therapy. Um, so there's that very, boy, heavy, uh, that heavy, heavy subject who uh, ends up married to a man and is now running an LGBTQ center for youth in St. Louis. So you get this huge dichotomy of, mm. is, can this person really, really be redeemed? But he's, he ends up, before you find out, he ends up the victim of a murder. So so it's it, this particular book is going through the investigation of, of the murder. And I just, I, I love the way that Gregory also uses dialogue when you're getting to the climactic part of the story and, and, and you know, you get the monologuing of this is, this is what happened and this is, this is why you did this and this and this and this. So you get the stream of words and eventually, eventually those stream of words sweep someone up in the truth. And so, so the, the, that is just uh, an amazing part of, of the story as well. Um, uh, alongside North and Shaw really trying to resolve their feelings for each other. And then he throws in a nice, a, a, a fun little side uh, investigation uh, that also plants some Easter eggs in there. That'll be fun for anybody who, who is familiar with Gregory's work. So, Ooh, so fun. it's, it really is again, you know, it's, it's, it's really second verse, same as the first, but I, you know, Gregory Ash just has his genre, his niche of writing down so beautifully so so beautifully so yeah every everything just seems to always come together um not simplistically mm, ever never you know, never ever simplistically um which is a, you know just the fact that he he takes all of these different threads and eventually ties them all together and makes them make sense in the end it's just uh it must take a phenomenal amount of plotting and, you know, um, notebooking and, and yeah. making sure that he has all these boxes ticked off. You know, I don't think that these are books that you can just sit down and, and be a pantser to write. I can't because, imagine. Yeah. You no, know, there are so many details and so many characters. You know, there's so many characters that he brings in. And, and ultimately, everybody, you know, it, sometimes you read a book and you wonder, well, you know, what, what purpose did that character serve? It just seems like they were part of the setting. All of his, all of his characters seem to, in some way, influence the stories and influence the scene that they're mm -hmm. in when they're in it. They don't necessarily have a huge role, but, but they are just always such influencers in yeah. the tone of the story, if not the plot itself. I learned that in, I th it was one of the early Hazard and Somerset books. There was like this scene that I'm like, okay. And then I, Oh, okay. That okay. person's back now, and they're important. Exactly. <laughs> and I've never, I've never like put one of his characters aside after that moment because no. they always no. have a purpose. There's never a throwaway character, and there's never a throwaway scene in his books. And I think that that's, I think that 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 is just such a sign of how tightly he writes. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, I was the same way with Hazard and Summer that I said, I thought, oh, well, gosh, he's kind of left this dangling. And then three books later, it's like, oh, no, he did it. Yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, yeah. yeah it's pretty so. amazing. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, if you're not yeah. reading Gregory Ash, everybody should at least give it a go if you're into romantic suspense at all. And, yes. Uh, I know it, it we're just, excited he's coming to GRL so we can like have our appropriate fanboy and fangirl moment over him. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm gonna <laughs> I might get a little, might get a little misty there. Yeah. Because, yeah, he just I'm such a fan. I'm just such an a, 
a huge fan of his writing. He, you know, and, and I think that it, like any, like any author in any book, you have to, you have to appreciate the genre that they write in in mm-hmm. order for you to appreciate the books. If you don't like romantic suspense, if you don't like murder mystery, if you like a softer kind of, uh, uh romance, then maybe you're not going to connect with his writing, but boy, yeah. he just, yeah, I am, I am grateful. So grateful that I just kind of happened upon yeah. his, his books because I'm grateful he, you did too. Cause it got me yeah, pulled in has, right there with he you. Has, <laughs> he has delivered for me every single mm-hmm. time without fail, without yeah. fail. So yeah. So, so transposition. And I also love the titles of the books orientation, transposition very much um very much describes the way shaw and north kind of kind of circle around each other and are really trying to figure out how they fit into each other's lives and and yeah i just love it love it love it love it so good and what are you reading right now because you're reading a pretty awesome book from what i know from before we hit the record button yeah, well, so far, so good. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it keeps up. Uh, this book just dropped a couple of days ago, I think. Um, it's called Swipe Right for Murder by Derek Millman. And uh, I believe, and I, I don't quote me on this because I haven't verified this before I've said it, but I believe it's a James Patterson publication. Mm. Um, so so I think he just... I think he just publishes it. I don't, he, he didn't have anything to do with the writing. I think Derek Millman did a hundred percent of the writing. There's no ghost writing going on here. Um, but uh, swipe right for murder is, is uh, the, the title itself is, is kind of an updated modern dial M for murder. Um, you know, who dials M for murder anymore? We are when, you know, so, so, so the, the protagonist is 17 years old. So this is a, a teen murder mystery, teen fiction murder mystery. Um, and he has the swipe right for murder is very much the, he was on, he was on a, a an app similar to a grinder, I suppose. And so he goes to the hotel room of a stranger. Um, and there is subsequently a murder. And so he is he is on the run. It's a case of mistaken identity. Very uh, I, I think this is going to be very Hitchcockian in in the way that this this uh, all unfolds with the with the mistaken identity and and him being on the run, kind of almost like a north by northwest kind of thing, even. So I'm really, really excited to get deeper into this one. So yeah, it should be should be really good. It's yeah, exciting so far. Just in the opening chapters, I am absolutely hooked. Sounds really good. And I love the title. It's such yeah. a great update to a classic. Exactly. Exactly. That's uh yeah, that, that was, that was one of the things that I was like, Ooh, that sounds, sounds like uh, something that I really need to dig into. So, so swipe right for murder by Derek Melman. Awesome. We'll link up in the show notes to all of these books, of course. And we're also going to put the link in for the novel approach reviews because you're back writing some reviews now. So people can check out some of your recommendations in between when we have you on the show too. We're very happy that you're back writing reviews there. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was it was kind of a, a, a natural progression. I think you you know, once you once you're a review writer, you're always a review writer. You don't you don't lose that uh, that love of sharing what you thought about a book with, with other readers. Um, so yeah, so Jules, uh, Jules loves to read Bower Socks. I don't know if you want to, to link up her, uh, her Facebook, um, page or not, but she and I, uh, have been reviewing together for years when the novel approach was in full swing. And so now it's just, we're a team of two and we're just kind of putting things out there. Uh, nothing, you know, n- nothing that, uh, is filling up every day of the week review wise, but, uh, but we're just throwing some things out there. We, we kind of cover the spectrum. I love the, the spec fic and, and the, the mysteries and she does the contemporaries and we both do some YA. So yeah, we're, we're, I think we're doing a good job of covering the spectrum of, of a lot of different, uh, genres and subgenres. So, so yeah, we're just a team of two just out there doing our thing. That's great. And we're, we're so glad to have your voices back in the review community. So people should well, definitely go check you. that out to see what you're recommending over there. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. 
And thank you so much for coming back and hanging out a little bit. We'll definitely have you back sometime in the fall and look forward to seeing you in just a few, well, I guess about two months at GRL. That's going to be so soon. I know. I know. It'll be here before we know it. But thank you always for having me. It's always such a pleasure. As usual, Lisa adds to my TBR. Uh, each of those books sounded awesome. And I was particularly into Swipe Right for Murder. Uh, it's very cool that James Patterson is having some connection to some LGBTQ YA style stories. So hopefully I will get to pick that up soon. And it's also terrific that Lisa and Jules are posting again over at the Novel Approach. As I said it in the, in the clip, it's really great to have their review voices back in the community full time. Oh, most definitely. Okay, guys, I think that's going to do it for this week's show. Just a quick reminder before we do, you can help support the Big Gay Fiction Podcast with a monthly pledge through Patreon. The additional support of our superfans helps pay for the costs of producing and distributing this show. Joining is easy, and you'll get special access to monthly bonus episodes, the opportunity to ask questions of our upcoming guests, and lots more. For all the details, simply go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Now, coming up in episode 203, Frederick Smith and Chaz Lamar join us to talk about In Case You Forgot. I love this book. Talked about it a few weeks ago. Got the opportunity to talk to these two while they were in Sacramento, just after they'd done their first author event together. So it was super good to get them after that. They have such good stories about this first co-writing project for them. So please do come back next week for that. So guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. For detailed show notes and links to everything discussed in this episode, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday at all major podcast distributors. You can also find us on YouTube. I'm Derek McLean. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.